From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. My name is Dr. Gregory Kerfman, a deputy editor of JAMA. And in this JAMA podcast, I'll be speaking with Dr. Deepak Bhatt. Dr. Bhatt is executive director of interventional cardiovascular programs at Brigham and Women's Hospital and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also a senior physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Bott, Dr. Renato Lopes, and Dr. Robert Harrington have written a review article titled Diagnosis and Treatment of Acute Coronary Syndromes, which appears in the February 15th, 2022 issue of JAMA. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Bott. It's great to be with you, Dr. Kerfman. Now, acute coronary syndromes are characterized by a sudden reduction in blood supply to the heart. And the syndromes include ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI, non ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or N STEMI, and unstable angina. The latter two are often grouped together as non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndromes. Each year, an estimated more than 7 million people in the world are diagnosed with acute coronary syndromes, including more than 1 million people hospitalized in the U.S. In this podcast, we want to bring our listeners up to date on these common and potentially serious conditions. Dr. Bhatt, to begin, could you please describe the different mechanisms and pathophysiology of STEMI, NSTEMI, and unstable angina? What is the pathology at the level of the coronary arteries in the three conditions? This is a great question that you've asked. And first of all, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the pathophysiology of acute coronary syndromes, whether we're referring to STEMI, NSTEMI, or unstable angina. One differentiator, perhaps, between STEMI and non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndromes is whether the artery is completely occluded, as is typically the case with ST elevation MI, or incompletely occluded, as is more often the case with a non-ST segment elevation MI or unstable angina. Though even there, there can be potential overlap. But let me start first with STEMI. There, typically, the underlying pathophysiology is plaque rupture. That is, rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque in the coronary artery. Most often, this is a lipid-rich plaque, a cholesterol-rich plaque, with inflammatory cells and heightened degrees of inflammation triggering plaque rupture. When that plaque ruptures and its inner contents are exposed to blood, a thrombus forms, typically a fibrin-rich and platelet-rich thrombus. This is the underlying pathophysiology of the majority of ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions. However, a good proportion of non-ST segment elevation MI or NSTEMI also has a very similar pathophysiology. Perhaps in this setting, it's a bit more common to have thrombus that is predominantly platelet-rich with perhaps a little bit less of a fibrin-rich component, but there really is a lot of commonality here. However, plaque erosion is something that's been recognized in more recent years as a cause of acute coronary syndromes, though perhaps a little bit more frequent in NSTEMI than STEMI. And what plaque erosion refers to is having the endothelial surface, the covering surface of, say, a plaque that gets denuded. So plaque erosion, often caused by some sort of perturbation in blood flow, and then formation of platelet-rich thrombus. But again, this could be the cause of STEMI, but it's a little bit more common in NSTEMI than STEMI. It's also a little bit more common in women than men. Now, there are other causes as well of acute coronary syndromes. Calcified nodules can cause STEMI or NSTEMI or unstable angina. And here, once more, there's lipid-rich plaque, 
encroaching upon the coronary artery lumen where blood would be flowing. But in this case, there's a lot of calcium that's involved in that plaque. And this is potentially important, not only from a mechanistic perspective, but if this patient were to end up in the catheterization lab with their acute coronary syndrome, the presence of that calcific nodule can pose some particular technical challenges. There are other etiologies for acute coronary syndromes as well. Again, plaque rupture is the most common, followed by plaque erosion, but then coronary spasm is a cause of acute coronary syndromes. This is where the smooth muscle that is in the artery constricts. It can be focal, it can be multifocal, it can be multivessel, it can involve the epicardial arteries, it can involve the microvasculature, and it does appear that coronary spasm, if we give provocative agents, say in the catheterization lab, such as acetylcholine, is maybe a little more common than we used to think it was. On the other hand, most of the time when it's suspected, it's treated empirically. But still, it's important to understand that it can be a part of the pathophysiology of acute coronary syndromes, either the primary player or sort of a secondary phenomenon, say, when the endothelium has been damaged and secondarily there may be spasm, and then there may secondarily also be thrombosis. Spontaneous dissection is another cause of acute coronary syndromes. It may manifest as STEMI or even NSTEMI, but a proportion in particular of ST elevation MI, we now know is due to SCAD or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. There are certain situations such as in the peripartum state where it might come up a little more frequently than otherwise. And this involves an intimal tear, uh, that is a tear of the inner layer of the coronary artery, and that can obstruct the coronary artery. In fact, we're still learning a lot about SCAD, including the pathophysiology of SCAD. There are some that believe that the mechanism is predominantly what I mentioned, a tear in the intima and a creation of a true lumen where blood is flowing as it should and a false lumen that can then fill with blood and compress or obliterate the artery lumen. There's also a line of thinking that some proportion of the spontaneous coronary dissections are from blood forming from the adventitial side of things and forming within the adventitian media of the artery, again, leading to a compressive phenomenon and obliteration of blood flow. So we're still learning a lot about the biology of SCAD, and it's likely the case there are several different forms with different specific pathophysiologies behind them. Another cause I'll mention is coronary artery embolism, uh, such as when someone has atrial fibrillation or a left ventricular thrombus that decides to move and obstruct a coronary artery. So this can cause the STEMI or NSTEMI. And then finally, there's a category called MINOCA, or MI with non-obstructive coronary arteries that accounts for about 5 to 6% of myocardial infarctions. And that basically means in those patients who have a coronary angiogram, there's no obstructive plaque. There might be some mild plaque, but no severe plaque. And then we assume that one of the causes I mentioned or some other causes on a rather long list of potential causes is the etiology of the acute coronary syndrome. And sometimes more advanced imaging, things like MRI, can help us get it what the pathophysiology might have been, what the reason for that MI with non-obstructive coronary arteries or MONOCA might have been. So as you can see, there are really a variety of different etiologies. Well, that's a great summary. Thank you very much for that. And just to be clear about the distinction between plaque rupture and plaque erosion, do you consider these to be different degrees of disruption of a plaque? Or does plaque rupture actually involve hemorrhage out of the plaque itself? And does that hemorrhage contribute to coronary thrombosis? So it's a great question. Plaque rupture more often results in complete arterial occlusion, as with a STEMI whereas plaque erosion may be more likely to lead to non-obstructive acute coronary syndrome, such as a non-ST segment elevation MI. And for reasons that aren't totally clear, it appears that plaque erosions 
a bit more common in women than men. What the reason for that is, I think, is, is something that will need to be elucidated in years to come that might provide some insights into why there may be some subtle differences in ACS presentations and trajectories after presentation in men versus women. The biology is a little bit different in as much as plaque erosion is more a response to the endothelium being disrupted or denuded, whereas plaque rupture, as you said, is more a matter of exposure of the inner contents of the plaque to the flowing blood and can include such things as intraplaque hemorrhage as well. So there are some differences if one looks at autopsy specimens, for example, between these two. There's also some potential implications for management. In general, plaque rupture that presents clinically uh, is going to be treated, if it's a STEMI, with a stent in most regions of the world or in regions of the world where that's not possible with fibrinolytic therapy, therapy directed towards breaking down the fibrin-rich thrombus. Whereas for plaque erosion, say in an end STEMI, there, in fact, fibrinolytic therapy has been found to be not useful, in fact, harmful in terms of causing bleeding complications with no benefit. And it does appear that a higher proportion of patients with plaque erosion may end up doing fine managed medically without stenting, as opposed to those with plaque rupture where stenting does seem to be particularly useful. So th there are some definite differences in the pathophysiology, and they do have implications for the treatment, some of which has been fully worked out, some of which really does need more research. All right. Thank you for that. Now, I wonder if we could turn to the clinical presentation of acute coronary syndromes. And are there differences in the clinical presentations among the three types of acute coronary syndromes? I wonder if you can discuss that for a moment. This is really a key point that you've raised for anyone directly involved with patient care. Understanding the pathophysiology is important for present care. It's important for future research. But understanding the differentiation among these acute coronary syndromes, that's critical for right now, for today in managing the care of patients with ACS. So the first step in a patient with suspected ACS, assuming that they're in an emergency setting, if they're calling from home or somewhere else, they need to call emergency medical services, 911 in the US, and be brought immediately to an emergency department. But then within 10 minutes of arrival, the standard of care is to get an ECG or electrocardiogram and there, the key thing to look for is whether ST segment elevation is present or is not present on the ECG. If it is present on the ECG, that is a STEMI or ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. That means everything needs to kick into high gear. The system needs to move quickly. Uh, that is a medical emergency, and time is muscle, as they say. It really matters to move quickly here. So that's a very important diagnosis to make. And we'll talk about the treatment later. But that ECG is key for that differentiation. If ST segment elevation is not present, well, then it is a non-ST segment elevation ACS. And that, broadly speaking, is then divided into N-STEMI, non-ST segment elevation MI, or unstable angina. Again, the key differentiator here between STEMI and non-STEMI type ACS is the ECG and whether ST elevation is or is not present. So now here, for the non-ST segment elevation ACS, there's no ST segment elevation present. The next step is to check a troponin level, preferably a high sensitivity troponin level. And if that is elevated initially or on subsequent testing, then the diagnosis of N-STEMI is made. If on the other hand, that troponin level is negative and remains negative on subsequent testing, then the diagnosis of unstable angina is made. So it really matters a lot what that electrocardiogram shows, and then in the case of non-ST segment elevation ACS, what that initial troponin shows or a subsequent troponin. And in terms of subsequent troponin, most algorithms would say, within three hours is when that subsequent troponin should be drawn. The most recent data actually suggest an algorithm of checking again in one or two hours, 
is probably even more efficient with no loss of sensitivity or specificity. So I think the way to get to STEMI and STEMI unstable angina is quite clear with use of the electrocardiogram and with use of the troponin. Now, of course, this is all in patients who presented with a clinical syndrome that's consistent with ACS. And we should talk about that a bit in terms of the symptoms. But in terms of the broad classifications, this is how to classify patients into the different types of acute coronary syndromes. Excellent. Well, you brought up symptoms. So why don't we talk about symptoms, which uh, sometimes can be very classic, but other times maybe not so much. Uh, Can you comment about that? Absolutely. So chest discomfort at rest is the most common presenting symptom of acute coronary syndromes. Uh, There's no question about it. And everything that I was talking about in terms of the categorization of ACS applies to patients presenting with a high pretest probability of having an ACS. So they're presenting with chest discomfort. I'm not referring to, say, troponin measurements that are done in the hospital for a variety of other reasons where the presenting symptom is something else or there's no symptom. Even in that circumstance, troponin elevation is a bad prognostic sign, but that isn't really what we're talking about today in terms of ACS and and how to manage acute coronary syndrome. So chest discomfort in both men and women is the most common presenting symptom, but it's important to realize that a significant number of patients will have other less specific symptoms such as dyspnea, which can occur in isolation, although more commonly still occurs with there being some sort of chest pain. I think In prior years, there's been lots of talk about atypical chest pain. The most recent American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association chest pain guidelines that just came out at the end of 2021 actively discouraged the use of that term atypical chest pain. And the reason is not just to be the word police, but to make sure that treating physicians realize that that nomenclature can sort of lead us down pathways that aren't useful. The historical thinking perhaps being that women are more likely to have atypical chest pain, for example. But it turns out that's really not true. Studies have shown, I'll quote one particular study, but there are several now, that approximately 79% of men and 74% of women presenting with acute coronary syndromes have chest discomfort at rest as their predominant presenting symptom. So yes, you could say, oh, that's more common in men than women, but 79 versus 74% to me is a relatively small difference, not clinically actionable. So again, the majority of men and women with ACS are presenting with chest discomfort at rest. Now, what about the what used to be called atypical uh, symptoms such as dyspnea? Well, it turns out that In the particular study I was quoting, for example, 48% of women did have nonspecific symptoms, but guess what? So did 40% of men. So again, these so-called nonspecific previously perhaps called atypical symptoms are occurring in women, that's true, but they're also occurring in men. But more importantly, in both the women and men, even if they are having these nonspecific symptoms, still a lot of them are also having chest discomfort. They might lead by saying, oh yes, I'm having really bad shortness of breath, but then it turns out they are also having chest discomfort. So the history as in all things remains very important. When such a history that's concerning of these sorts of symptoms of chest discomfort, chest pain, chest pressure, uh, dyspnea, et cetera, are occurring at rest and are significant, well, ACS should be suspected. And then we need to launch into the algorithm that you and I just reviewed in terms of ECG within 10 minutes, and then high sensitivity troponin testing shortly thereafter. So let's say we now have a diagnosis and we want to move quickly on to treatment. And the treatment of the three types of acute coronary syndromes has advanced substantially in recent years. And there is overlap among therapies for the three categories of acute coronary syndromes. Treatment might be broadly categorized into reperfusion therapies on the one hand and medical therapies on the other. And if we could begin with STEMI, I wonder if you could please discuss the recommended steps in the management of STEMI. 
Absolutely. This is really important to know because time matters, as I alluded to before. So all the patients presenting with ACS of all three types should be treated with antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy on presentation. At a minimum, this is typically often aspirin and unfractionated heparin, but there could be more in terms of antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy. But then the key sort of determination, as I mentioned, is ECG. And if there's ST elevation, it's time to activate, that is call, the cardiac catheterization lab. If there is a catheterization lab that's available within two hours, data show that's the way to go. Take that patient to the cath lab with the STEMI. And uh, more often than not, there's an obstructed epicardial coronary artery. Open it up, typically with a stent, and that is the treatment of choice. Now, if there isn't a catheterization lab available within two hours because there's a blizzard or because it's a part of the world where there aren't cath labs that are as commonly placed, well, then the best thing to do is to treat promptly with fibrinolytic therapy or thrombolytic therapy, as it used to be called. And there are altiplase, rotaplase, or tenecteplase are the agents of choice. But if cost is an issue in that particular region of the world, streptokinase remains an option as well for fibrinolytic therapy. Even in those patients treated with lytics, they should then be transferred to a facility that can perform percutaneous coronary intervention within the next six to 24 hours or so. Great. Now, in terms of NSTEMI, are there any important differences between the management of NSTEMI and STEMI? It's a terrific question. In general, it's felt that the timing is urgent, but not quite as emergent as with STEMI. But that can sometimes be misleading because sometimes NSTEMIs are STEMIs in disguise. So for example, the left circumflex artery and occlusions that are notorious for not presenting with ST segment elevation, same sort of situation with a large diagonal branch off the left anterior descending artery, where there may not be ST segment elevation on the 12 lead surface ECG, but in fact, there is an occluded artery. So in patients that are having an NSTEMI that appear to be high risk, such as those with ongoing chest pain despite initial medical therapy, marked ST segment depression that is new and persists, if an echocardiogram is done in the emergency department, a patient with a presumed new wall motion abnormality, those patients should be treated just like an ST segment elevation MI patient in terms of going to the cath lab emergently. But in the majority of NSTEMI cases where that's probably not going to be the case, there you still want to move quickly. Uh, typically, the guidelines would say within 24 to at most 48 hours or so, to get that patient to the cardiac catheterization lab, assuming that they don't have any contraindications, and then based on the coronary anatomy, undergoing revascularization. About 60% or so of patients will end up getting a coronary stent. About 10% or so will get coronary artery bypass surgery during that index hospitalization, and the remainder will be treated with medical therapy only. Of course, all the patients will be treated with medical therapy and be given lifestyle modification recommendations on discharge, but specifically the ones who have severe blockages will be treated percutaneously or with surgery. So that's the management of NSTEMI in general. Though low-risk NSTEMI or unstable angina can be managed medically as well as the initial therapy where the medicines I mentioned are given, but Additionally, medicines directed towards controlling ischemia, things like beta blockers, but also other risk factor control medicines, lipid lowering therapy, et cetera, employed. And if the patient continues to have symptoms, then they would go on to the catheterization lab. In that more so called conservative strategy, where initial medical therapy only is utilized, well, there it would make sense to also do early on some sort of non invasive evaluation. Historically, that's been stress testing, but more recently in areas where it's available, non-invasive computed tomography angiography or CT angio has really caught on as a quick way to exclude severe coronary artery disease. That is, if that comes back looking pretty normal, it's unlikely that the patient has an ACS. Whereas if that comes back looking like there's severe coronary artery disease or it's a bit ambiguous, then the patient will likely undergo cardiac catheterization anyway. So there is, I think, a lot more subtlety to the management of non-ST segmentation ACS than there is of STEMI with a few different pathways that are possible. But in general, patients that are higher risk, 
even those that have unstable angina with negative troponins, if they've got things such as heart failure, dynamic ECG changes, ongoing chest discomfort, any sign of hemodynamic instability, they're, again, prompt catheterization, and if appropriate, based on the anatomy, revascularization would be indicated. Great. Thank you very much. Now, I wonder if there's any specific guidance that you'd offer physicians as they provide longer-term care and follow-up for their patients with acute coronary syndromes. What potential complications should physicians be especially mindful of during that longer-term follow-up period? This is really an important aspect of the care of the patient with ACS. So far, we focused in this conversation on the early care. That's critically important, of course. But the long-term care is as well. Data such as from the REACH registry published in JAMA some years ago showed that in patients with atherosclerosis, if they had a history of prior MI, and I'll generalize here to say prior ACS, they have a substantial rate of recurrent ischemic events, about 20% or so at least will have an ischemic event such as cardiovascular death, MI, stroke in the next four years or so. So these are high-risk patients, even if they've done well initially. It's important to recognize that. It's important to provide counseling regarding lifestyle modification, including things such as smoking cessation or vaping cessation or cessation of use of any sorts of tobacco products. Important to counsel against drug abuse, a proportion of MIs are due to things like cocaine or amphetamine or opioid use or even marijuana. Many physicians actually don't know of that relationship between marijuana use and myocardial infarction. So important to counsel patients against uh, using all those different substances. For those that are overweight, weight loss would be important. A diet, I would say in particular a diet that is uh, plant-based, I would generally recommend. And daily exercise is another important part. So all of this, I think, is easiest to institute by referral to a formal cardiac rehabilitation program that remains quite underutilized in the United States and worldwide, but I think every patient with ACS should at least be offered that possibility of cardiac rehabilitation where all the different lifestyle measures and more can be implemented. Beyond the lifestyle aspect, then there's medical therapy. So the majority of patients being discharged with acute coronary syndromes should be discharged on dual antiplatelet therapy. That means aspirin, typically low-dose aspirin in the range of 75 to 100 milligrams a day, and also an ADP receptor antagonist, and the choices are clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrelor, and probably goes beyond the amount of time we have to discuss all the issues pertaining to choice of agent there, but the review article does touch upon some of those considerations. So dual antiplatelet therapy for the majority of patients with ACS, irrespective of whether that treatment was with a stent or bypass surgery or medications alone. In addition to dual antiplatelet therapy, then we want to make sure that the patients are on potent LDL reducing therapy. So by that, I mean high intensity statins for all patients barring true contraindications or intolerances. Azetamide for many patients is a way to further lower their LDL cholesterol. Potentially, if the triglycerides are elevated, consideration of icosapent ethyl. And then medicines that have been used historically in ACS patients, such as beta blockers and ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers and mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. Now there, it sort of depends on different things. Beta blockers are strongly indicated if there's left ventricular dysfunction or if there's significant residual coronary artery disease with angina. It's not so clear what their utility is if the left ventricular function is totally normal and the patient has been fully revascularized. Uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs are strongly indicated if there's left ventricular dysfunction or diabetes, or if there's just hypertension that needs to be treated. And mineral corticoid receptor antagonists specifically for patients with left ventricular dysfunction. So it's a rather long list of things to consider. The patient, especially the de novo ACS patient, might have come in with no medicines, but now they're going to go out on a lot. So we have to consider pill burden and cost and a number of other issues as well. But that's the basic list of medications that one should consider beyond just good control of hypertension, good control in those that have it of diabetes and other cardiovascular risk factors. 
So there are a lot of therapeutic interventions uh, that need to be considered in patients with acute coronary syndromes. And before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you if you foresee any new developments in the management of acute coronary syndromes on the horizon. Do you anticipate novel advances that physicians should be watching for? I'm glad you asked. In this review article, hopefully your readers will see that ACS and the study of ACS is very dynamic. There's a lot that's already been going on in the field over the past few years, over the past several years. It's not ACS like it used to be, say, a decade ago. Similarly, I think in the next decade, we'll see tremendous advances in the field of acute coronary syndromes in terms of what's going on in the catheterization lab, further advances in stent technology, further advances in assessing whether coronary lesions are significant and should or should not be stented, further advances in cardiac surgery as well, further advances in medical therapy that would apply to the vast majority of ACS patients where I hope we'll have antithrombotic agents that are not only potent, but perhaps less bleeding risk than what we have available today. As well, in terms of the lipid axis, I think we'll have even more potent ways of lowering LDL cholesterol and associated lipid-related and inflammatory biomarkers. There are a number of randomized clinical trials that are going on that are looking at a variety of different agents that target the lipid axis, the inflammatory axis, drugs that are diabetes drugs, such as SGLT2 inhibitors that are being studied in post-ACS patients. So really, it's a long list of medicines that are being studied. Some are drugs that are being used for other indications. I mentioned the SGLT2 inhibitors. Others are being developed specifically as novel agents. And finally, I'll just say there's also work going on in terms of remote monitoring of patients. So potentially in the future, we'll have a situation maybe using wearables where patients who are at high risk for ACS, such as ones who already had an ACS, are monitored remotely. And there's a trigger that goes off with their wearable, their their smartphone or, or whatever that lets them know or, or lets their physician know or lets emergency medical services know that there might be trouble brewing. So I see a lot of advances coming in the next decade in ACS. Well, Dr. Bott, you are a fountain of knowledge on this topic and other topics too. So thank you very much for your insightful commentary on these important clinical conditions. Thank you very much. And thanks to all our listeners. And I want to remind listeners that further details about acute coronary syndromes may be found in the review article by Drs. Bott, Lopes, and Harrington in the February 15, 2022 issue of JAMA. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. The audio team here also includes Jesse McWhorters, Shelley Steffens, Lisa Harden, Audrey Foreman, Marilyn Frickaluck, and Dr. Robert Golub is the JAMA Executive Deputy Editor. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at gemmanetworkaudio.com. Once again, I'm Dr. Gregory Kerfman, a deputy editor at JAMA.